Working Cows Podcast, Episode 158. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Egg Network, here with another episode for you. Uh, excited to be joined by Michelle Rayness. Uh, she has written a book and created a brand, and I'm excited to talk to her about that. Uh, links to her book and uh, more information about how you can get in touch with her will be at the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 158. Um, I will say on the front end of this episode, um, I have a standard for this podcast, and so it goes fairly deep, but just humor me for a second, and I'll explain it to you uh, as as briefly as I can. Uh, One of my greatest fears as a pastor is that my kids will grow up to resent the church, and... um, you know, because I, I believe the church is a, is is the leading edge of what God is doing in the world, and so um, I try to do everything that I can uh, not to not to push that ball of of potentially leading to my kids resenting the church down the field any farther. So uh, part of that I believe is not me not being a hypocrite, uh, me owning it when I mess up with my kids, uh, and then me also not having uh, double standards as much as possible. And so I have a standard for my kids about the content that they consume, and I'm going to try to abide by not creating content that I wouldn't allow my kids to consume. So uh, Michelle's got a provocative title for her brand and her book, uh, and and so I've gone through and I've, I've taken out all of the uh, provocative words uh, that that go along with that, and so it might seem a little bit choppy, uh, but it it is just part of what I think I've got to do to continue to uh, raise raise my kids and and be uh, the best um, representation of Jesus that I can to my kids. Uh, so. I guess that's there. There it is. There's <laughs> there's my my philosophy and and why I approached editing and producing this episode the way I did. Uh, but for now, uh, really excited to be joined by Michelle Rayness. Uh, Michelle, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. You have uh, started a brand and uh, la- launched a book along with that uh, called Badass Leader. Could you tell me a little bit about the journey to starting that and, and where what was the impetus for, for getting that off the ground? Thank you for asking. I would say the, the impetus had more to do with my journey and the lessons that I learned and the mistakes that I made along the way. And I found myself over the past several years in working particularly with producers um, since 2013, um, sharing my story and the bumps and bruises I've had along the way. And in conversation with them, I found that there really was a gap and a need to try and reach an audience with a resource that felt like it was for them and not for, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, the white collar corporate folks that sit in an office all day. And so I was really inspired to put this book and my stories into a formal brand that felt um, familiar or approachable to the everyday leader. And the book itself is called From Bad to Bad Leader. And the reason for the title is because it's an autobiography. And it's a story of my journey from being a bad boss and then being inspired to figure it out and learn how to become um, ultimately a bad leader, which is a, you know, it's an evolution, right? So I'm still striving to be a bad leader. And I've learned a lot over the years, and it's been a ton of fun sharing it in this book and being able to bring this brand to life. And could you tell me a little bit about the Michelle pre uh, this <laughs> cathartic moment <laughs> uh, that that kind of inspired you to go on this journey. Uh, 
a little bit about your background. What what were what capacity were you leading in, and uh, what were some of the maybe some of the symptoms of a bad leader? Yeah, definitely. I call it my my cataclysmic wake up call, <laughs> which was um, to say the least rather uncomfortable. So my background, I'd started out. Now my background is not in agriculture, and I was working in the Atlanta market in a sales position and really doing an amazing job and extremely competitive and putting some big numbers on the board. And the numbers ended up being so so large, and this was a rather large corporation that was based out of Chicago, that it caught the attention of the powers that be in the headquarters. As a result, I was offered an initial kind of minor step up, a promotion um, to a team of three people. I was one of the three, so a really tiny team. <laughs> and um, and I worked on a brand new um, development and ran that project for about six months. I estimate around six months. And we ended up breaking records and coming in ahead of schedule, which then again uh, um, earned me the opportunity to have an even bigger promotion, and which involved a relocation to downtown Chicago. So I literally flew to Chicago on a Friday started work on Monday as a Chicago resident. And in that um, new role, I was suddenly promoted to general manager. And for those of you who are familiar with the term, the Peter principle, it's uh, I'll define it quickly, but in simple terms, it's when you get promoted to your level of incompetence, which (laughs) I most definitely was. (laughs) And it really showed up for me when inside of less than a year. It was somewhere between six and 12 months. I came into my office and um, was introduced to a pile of resignations and keys and some Mm. very upset team team members who um, in very colorful and well-deserved language and adjectives, let me know where to stick it and exactly what they thought of me as Mm. a boss. And I suffered a a walkout and of very significant (laughs) Um, quantity and um, positions. Um, And it was um, the first time that I realized that, oh my gosh, I'm not doing something right. And the, this is where it gets tricky, right? When on paper, we looked like we were kicking it. We were getting it done. I mean, our reports were great. Our month Mm. over month was fantastic. We were, um, you know, you would have thought we were rock stars if you were sitting in a corporate office and reviewing the reports. But when it came to the people parts, it was, you know, um, for dramatic effect, I'll use the word bloodbath, but it was really bad. I mean, it was um, the way I I led, I wouldn't even call it lead, the way I micromanaged and Mm -hmm. hovered and um, went for needles in the haystack, um, pointed out everything that they were doing wrong, uh, constantly pushed. I mean, just it was, it was dominant. It was aggressive. It was disrespectful. It was smothering. It demoralized people. And as long as we were getting the numbers, I was really excited and really proud of myself and thinking Mm. that, you know, hey, we're kicking over here. We're getting it done. And the reality was behind the scenes, I had a team who was planning a walkout and they planned it to happen all at the same time, all on the same day. Now, if that isn't Mm. the biggest kind of F you, you know, Mm. sending me a message letting me know how awful I was. I mean, that was very powerful. It's, it's one thing if people walk out on you and it's another thing when they align to walk out on you, they really wanted to send a message and ultimately um, have me, you know, ousted for my position. So that was my, I would say my cataclysmic wake up call because what ended up happening is now I've been relocated from the Atlanta market up to Chicago, left my friends, my family, Mm. my car, everything. And now moving into Chicago, you know, getting fired would be, you know, having to move back home. And I didn't even have two nickels to rub together to, or a car to drive home for that matter. Mm. And so it was, Uh, an awakening for me to recognize that I needed to figure this leadership thing out and figure out how to get people to want to play on my team. And that the problem um, wasn't them. It was ultimately me. And it it took me about an hour to recognize that, (laughs) knowing that I had to call the boss and let him know what happened. It's not something I could hide, right, or sweep under the rug. It was, and and the the worst part was they were unionized. 
And so then mm -hmm. I had to deal with union grievances and uh, union relationships that were um, damaged and get educated on how do I fix that, you know, and that is a, um, that is a tough road to travel, but it was a really important um, part of my journey. And that's why lesson one in the book is called don't be an because I was, and it can have catastrophic effects if we don't, if we're unconscious and we don't recognize the collateral damage that we can create when we don't know how to lead. So to me, you know, I, I, the word that came to mind was kind of uh, tyrannical. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I, maybe micromanager is a better, a better word for it. Definitely but, micromanager. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was kind of, uh, you you had your your hand and your fingers and everything, and uh, you you wanted to make sure that you were aware of how all of the eyes got dotted and the T's got crossed, and uh, like you said, that was kind of a smothering environment for those those folks to work in. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about the the lack of st lack of sustainability in bad leadership? Um. It's not sustainable. It's, you know, what it does is exactly what it did for me, right? On the short term, it did create results. Our numbers improved significantly, but it's definitely not sustainable because you erode trust. You build a team that lacks confidence because they're constantly mm -hmm. nitpicked by you. And if they're micromanaged, the message that you're sending them is, I don't trust you. I think you're incompetent and I need to constantly hover over you and, um, point out every little thing that's wrong. And it was a, for me, it was a huge power um, play. You know, it was my ego. I wanted credit. I wanted to be the turnaround hero. I was going to get in and just show everybody how awesome I was as a boss and show my team and show my parents and show my bosses. And so it was very self-centered and it lacked self-awareness and emotional intelligence, zero emotional mm. intelligence. And it's extremely catastrophic. And what it does is it demoralizes people. It disengages them at an extremely high level to the point that they go to undermining and aligning and, and strategizing a walkout. Mm. And or they start stealing or they are in, in the space of agriculture. They abuse animals. They abuse mm. tools. They walk off with equipment. They lack um, preventative maintenance and care. They um, start to have conflicts with one another. When you create that type of a culture that is un not trusting and that is one where someone isn't good enough, they can't do anything right, and they feel um, they don't feel valued, then we really start to create this, this downward spiral of this toxic culture. And then the worst part is what I did is when things, now things were going up, right? Things were improving because I was still in the number stage. But as years went on and I started to really recognize this, when, when things start to unravel, then as a manager, not as a leader, then I start reprimanding and taking corrective action and writing people up. And, and, and so I'm just adding fuel to the fire on the toxicity because I'm still not recognizing mm -hmm. that I'm the one who, at the end of the day, the things that I always say is our people are our results. If there's an issue with our people, the first place that we need to check is in the mirror and say, great, how am I showing up mm. for them? What is it that I'm, how am I creating this? Because that's something I can fix and I can influence. Either I don't, I either I lack self-understanding or maybe I just don't understand my team. And if I don't understand my team, then I don't know how to coach them. I don't know how to motivate them. I don't know how to recognize them. You know, I'm completely lack of, of awareness of how to even develop them. If I don't understand where they're at and where they need development because they're fearful of me, you know, so it's this, uh, it's a, that this is what makes managing people such a nightmare for so many, I would say managers, not leaders, because we haven't figured out that the, the, the first things first is to, is, you know, get into, uh, understand ourselves and understand what's working, what's not working, what we need to do different, and then leverage resources and tools to fix ourselves first and become the best leader that we can be and then shift that focus to now, how do I understand my people and understand who I get to be for them in order to bring out the best in them? Hmm. 
you know, one of the, one of the um, comments that I'll add in here with respect to my introduction into agriculture, which is I'm young when it comes to someone who's been serving this community. I've been serving, I've had the privilege of serving agriculture um, as a consultant and a coach with Zo Zoetis, um, which I'm no longer with Zoetis as of this year, but um, I was a consultant for them, a third party consultant, not an employee. And what I recognize is that, you know, I really paid attention to the definition of agriculture which I have is, you know, it's the practice of farming, including cultivation of the soil for growing crops and rearing livestock. And I think about what I do, you know, is people culture, right? So it's, they go together. It's, it, it's so important that they go together. And so I think about that definition. And when I work with those who feed our families, our communities and our country, I think about how can I have this industry really embrace this people culture piece and let's add it to the front of the definition of agriculture and redefine it as the practice of caring for the people who farm and cultivate the soil for growing crops and rearing livestock. You know, it's mission critical that we are stewards of the people who care for our livestock, our land, and our legacy. And we have to get this right and we have to make people a priority. And what I find across the classrooms throughout the U.S. have been a resistance. You know, there's a mindset among some producers, not a resistance among all, but there are some that really have it wired. Nope, nope, the cows come first. And, you know, my invitation for them is to think about answering this question. Um, who takes care of your cows? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the cows come first until the people walk out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're right. left there by yourself. Yeah. So uh, you have developed this, uh, this, these tools and uh, you've got uh, some leadership lessons uh, that I would like to work through with you today. Uh, and so I guess I'd, I'd let, I'd give you the floor just to start us with the first one and then I'll try to uh, jump in and, and ask some follow-up questions uh, as we, as we pass through each one of those lessons. Oh, absolutely. Well, first, I'd like to introduce the book. The book is from Bad to Bad Leader. And I'll, I'll put the disclaimer right up front to say that this book isn't for everyone. You know, there are a lot of leadership books out there. And I wrote this book for the everyday leader. And again, for the person who's searching for a brand that is more relatable, fun, approachable when it comes to learning how to lead, it's really written in conversational form. And it has humor and illustrations, but there are some really um, important stories and lessons that my hope is that you'll relate them to your own story and, um, and then incorporate these 12 lessons into your daily practices to help you and your teams become better um, teams and leaders. So the first, the first lesson, um, which I mentioned earlier, is lesson one, which is don't be an and then the second, uh, in that lesson, I already explained, which is about the my cataclysmic wake-up call, <laughs> which then invited me to visit in, um, lesson two, which is stop, drop, take a selfie. And in that lesson, the focus is really understanding yourself, what's working, what's not working, and what you need to do differently, who you get to be. And then lesson three is let's talk about trust, baby. Because when it comes down to it, if your people don't feel safe and they don't trust you, then you're going to have a hell of a time building a bad team. You you talked about emotional intelligence, and uh, the question I wrote down while you were talking about that is: Can EQ or emotional intelligence can that be learned? Is that something that people can can learn, or Absolutely. is it something you've got? Okay. <laughs> it can. I mean, look at my bull ride, right? I call I refer to my cataclysmic event as my hashtag bull ride. Yeah. And that was where, you know, I, I was um, my fall from grace, if you will, as a manager. And so I was a disaster. I, I didn't have any emotional intelligence whatsoever. And it was really, um, I, I owe that first team that that 
provided me with that wake up call. This was my beginning on where I said, oh, wow, I've really got to get this right. And so then I started investing in trying to learn how to lead differently and learn those emotional intelligence skills, which now my story started back in the 1990s when there was slim pickings when it came to leadership tools and resources. Back then, it was still very top down, very autocratic, not like today where we're much better at understanding the importance of um, leveraging emotional intelligence and self-development um, for leaders. So um, thankfully, there are t- there's no excuse for a leader not to learn how to lead today. There are tons of resources. So yes, it can absolutely be learned. And it's a lot of fun, and it is a lot easier than it sounds. It might feel awkward and uncomfortable, which is great, because that means you're growing, you're outside your comfort zone. But it is, um, it's not you know, brain surgery. It can be, it can be done and it actually feels really good. And when you start, when you get it right, then every day beyond that gets easier for you and for your team. And it also leads to much greater profitability and better animal welfare. Yeah. And Dallas Mount is the CEO and, and owner of Ranch Management Consultants, and, and they put on the ranch, Ranching for Profit School. And uh, he always gets ta- tasked with the issue of coming on the Working Cows podcast and talking about people issues. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we've, we've talked about you know, work, meetings, working on the business, having meetings to work on the business. And, we, and then most recently on episode 156, uh, we just talked about how to handle and, and initiate and facilitate difficult conversations. And every time I have him on, I end up uttering the same sentence, and I'll, I'll repeat it here. Uh, you know, you've got to be okay with not being good at this the first few times you try it. You know, yeah. you've got to be okay with knowing that you're learning something. Um, and that's hard for people. Uh, that's hard for ranchers. It's hard for people who have been land and animal managers before they were people managers because they, they're they used to knowing when when it's time to move the cows to a fresh piece of grass they're used to knowing when it's time to take a step towards that cow in the corral and she's going to respond this way and and having all of these kind of formulaic things that that they understand how they all fit together and then when they start to reorient their perspective and see themselves as a people manager uh and they the first time they try it you know they might crash and burn uh that can be kind of a tough a tough pill to swallow yeah well i look at it the, the metaphor that I think of is like, you know, when you, when you go to the idea of working out and going to the gym and lifting weights, right? The, the reason why the muscles get built is because of the tear down, right? And so when, whether we're learning, you know, um, a new skill set or you're learning emotional intelligence or you're trying to become a people leader, um, the idea is to go through the, that, that, Uh, outside your comfort zone. If you're not outside your comfort zone, you're going to do what you've always done and you're going to get what you've always gotten. The idea here is to, um, is to stretch and to be uncomfortable and to give yourself permission for it to get messy and let your people know uh, that, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to work on this leadership thing. I don't have it figured out and I'm going to be practicing on you guys. And, and sometimes it's, you know, I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth and sometimes I'm not going to do it right. And, you know, that's vulnerability and, and that ties perfectly into lesson three, which is let's talk about trust, baby. If we can't, be vulnerable with our people. And I'm not talking about getting a box of tissues out type of vulnerability. I'm talking about being honest about the fact that, hey, we're trying to figure this out. We're learning, we're growing, we're going to do it together. And it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to get back in there and figure out what worked, what I call the postmortem, right? What worked, what didn't work, what do we learn and what can we do differently? And I think that that shows that you're human as a leader, which is critically important when you're trying to build trust with a team. So absolutely give yourselves permission to let it be messy. Leadership is people work and, and it's uh, and it can be messy and don't be afraid of that. I mean, gosh, you guys are, look at what you do for a living. I'm, I'm so inspired by those in the space of those uh, who feed. And so this people stuff isn't as hard as, as it looks, it, but it is uncomfortable and it's different, but you'll, um, you'll get there. And there, and there, um, a, a lot of, you know, to me, Follow the 12 lessons, follow them in order. It's just the recipe to help you build your own competencies and your confidence when it comes to how to lead. So how does, how does lesson three build on lesson two? How, how is developing trust in the team uh, related to 
I'm assuming lesson two is is kind of about knowing yourself, yes. <laughs> knowing knowing that you've got these specific skill sets and not trying to be somebody you're not necessarily. Absolutely, yeah. Because if you really aren't being authentic and you don't know yourself, you don't know what's working. You really don't have an understanding of how you show up and how you're perceived by your team. You don't understand how you communicate, what your behavioral tendencies are and how you prioritize and what your preferences are, then it's really difficult for you to even think about how you're ever going to build trust with others, right? So that authentic, you know, understanding, right? Good, bad, and ugly um, is critically important because then you can share that with your team. This is, you know, this is what I, I'm aware of that I'm working on. This is where I'm a work in progress. You know, these are the things that I think are my strengths. What do you guys think, right? And so asking for that feedback and working together, um, toward ultimately building that bad team, you have to understand yourself. So lesson two comes first, and then you can move into lesson three, which is really starting to cultivate, well, who do I get to be in order to cultivate trust with my team or my crew and um, making them feel safe. And that doesn't mean tiptoeing around issues. It doesn't mean that you can't point out things when they're not right. They're, it's just having them trust that you have their best interest at heart and that your feedback is meant for their development and their success. It's not about uh, from like in my, the story of my bull ride days, right? It was really about me and my ego and wanting to be, you know, the kick best manager and get all the, put all the numbers on the board and take all the credit, right? Building trust involves giving the credit and taking responsibility and partnering and investing in your people and so that they can trust that the feedback that they're getting is for their betterment and for or for the betterment of the team or the betterment of the cows or the betterment of the land, right? And so um, those intentions are, are critically important so that they can trust that, you know, as uh, one of my favorite sayings is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And uh, they need to trust that because then once they trust that, then they're really open to coaching and to feedback and to, um, to taking ownership and engaging at a very high level and run it. Like I like to say is I like to build teams that run it like they own it. Like it's their name on the sign out front and their mind, not, our, not ours. And how do we, how do we move from building trust to putting people first uh, lesson four? So once people have that feeling of safety and that you're prioritizing appropriately and that they can really trust you, then um, putting people first is just the natural next step. It's where we prioritize people over performance or we prioritize in this space, you know, the people come first, right? The cows come next because the people are taking care of our cows, our land and our legacy. And so um, prioritizing people is understanding all of their individual strengths and weaknesses, knowing how, learning how to coach to to those, um, being able to um, keep, you know, keep, your priorities and perspective that if you take care of them first, then they'll take care of everything else and I, walking that talk consistently. So every time I go to a, a conference and there is a session on personality profiles, essentially, I kind of roll my eyes at first <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then I sit in on it and I'm like, man, I wish my whole team would have been there for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's always so valuable and everyone has its own uh, unique twist on it. And so are there tools that you that you like to use as far as helping teams understand each other? Uh, you know, after we've understood ourselves, uh, we know what our strengths and weaknesses are. We're not trying to be somebody we're not. Are there, are there tools that you like to uh have the whole team go through together so that we see, oh, this person fits kind of in this quadrant. They're, they're wired kind of this way. Uh, here's how we should relate to them and, and, and get the best results that way. Yeah, most definitely. And there are a, t a ton of tools out there, but I'm extremely passionate about one in particular so much. In fact, that my second company MDR coaching and consulting is an authorized partner and we actually invested in becoming a partner for the for the brand and that is everything disc and the mm -hmm. reason why i mean i'm also an mbti certified and i've 
done a ton of other um, personality profiles and, and tools out there, but I'm a fan of, you know, the kiss roll. Like, let's keep it simple. And if it's simple and it's understandable, then it's very easily and rapidly executable. And that's at the end of the day, that's where you get traction. You've got, it's one thing to have this really great sexy tool that tells you all this stuff. And then you walk away, you put it in a file somewhere, it collects dust and you don't do anything with it. It's another thing when you can leverage a resource like DISC and really understand yourselves and understand teammates and in a way that you can the same day start to use the language and start to execute and implement. And then the, the, the role of the leader is to keep it alive, keep those conversations going, keep it alive, understand how to give feedback um, in a way that, you know, uh, just use DISC as an example. You have someone who's a high D on DISC, that's a dominant profile, right? So they're going to be oriented to being results focused, challenge oriented. They'll challenge for results and they'll challenge for action. And if they're leading um, someone who is an I and they approach in their D manner, then it's probably not going to land as well. And so DISC also supports emotional intelligence and in that it enables us to have the information that we need to understand that that I profile is uh, high and I stands for influence. And they're going to be oriented in prioritizing things differently when it comes to preferences and priorities. So they're enthusiastic. They're motivated through collaborating and talking about ideas and solutions. They're also action oriented. And so if I understand that about my team member, then I I know that I'm going to approach them with enthusiasm. I'm going to invite them to collaborate. And then we're going to align around some actions that they can take. And when I do that, what that does is accelerates my priorities being met because now I'm going to get a better result and I'm oriented to results, right? So it's the onus is on the leader for us to, it's up to us to figure out how do we get our teams to perform at their peak levels. How do we add that? What I say in my book is how do we add that VP racing fuel for people to get them motivated and focused and accelerated and excited around the things that are critically important for our business. And that at the end of the day is up to us. And how do we move from lesson four to lesson five? Lesson five is where we introduce becoming an epic coach. And so I can't think of a role more important for a leader that has people that report to them. It's one thing if you're a solopreneur, right? Then to be investing in your coaching skills, you know, learn how, how do I give feedback? How do I have those productive conversations? How do I address conflict in a way that's healthy and good for business and that fosters the best ideas winning, right? Not egos and, and personalities conflicting. Um, how do I um, appropriately recognize people? How do I develop them and train them? How do I teach them? Right? So become investing in your own development when it comes to understanding how to become a coach is the best hands down, in my opinion, as a leader of 34 years and managing very large teams. I mean, just to give you some numbers, my last uh, team was uh, over 160 uh, um, people. So, I mean, it's not, it's not small teams, right? And um, so is, is to become an epic coach and learn how to do what I call um, platinum feedback, you know, and the, you know, all of us are pretty familiar with the golden rule, which is, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, problem with that when it comes to leadership is that our teams are not us. And so the platinum rule is treat people the way they want to be treated, which mm -hmm. includes coach people the way they need to be coached, give them feedback the way they need to hear it, um, you know, motivate, inspire, redirect, hold them accountable, platinum style. And so those coaching skills are, you know, to me, that is what's going to take you to the next lesson, which is building that bad team. Because if you think about the, the lesson journey, one through five, right, if we don't get one through five right, you can't expect to just magically build a badass team. Right? You can call them a badass team, but at the end of the day, they're not going to be that, um, you know, pulling onto the ranch, seeing their name on the sign out front, running it like they own it, passionate about your business as if it's their own, and knowing how to give feedback and to contribute their ideas. You're not going to reach that, that peak uh, performance and level of engagement without handling lesson one through five first.
lesson six is kind of about uh, making sure people are where they belong on the team. Is that? Yeah. Right person, right chair. And then, um, and then also setting the expectations for how they treat one another. Right. So, a, mm. you know, it's not a bad team of individuals, right? It's mm. a collective team. So it's yep. being able to establish a team that's cohesive, that um, one of the resources and tools I'm very passionate about as well as the five behaviors of a cohesive team. And that is, you know, understanding the elements and what it takes as a leader to build that, um, that type of a culture and set the expectations for how we will treat one another, how we will engage and how we will perform. I refer to it in my um, book and also how I led was I built musketeer teams, you know, with that all for one, one for all mindset. And that's a, that is established by the leader and those expectations are, are set and you need to, you need to fight for that musketeer mindset and, and, and not let people get away with behaviors that are unbecoming that type of culture. Now we're we're moving on to lesson seven, and uh, how does that fit together with where we've been and and where we're going? Well, lesson seven. Well, first off, lesson six, which is build a bad team, is I will tell you this: it's the tipping point, right? It's where things start mm-hmm. to get really easy because once you have that, you know, bad team in place, then you can go to lesson seven. If you prematurely pop the cork on lesson seven, which is create the struggle, you're going to be perceived as an You're going to be right back at lesson one. And if you haven't established trust, you're going to actually erode trust, right? And you're going to start having the unwinding of what you're trying to create happen. So you can't create the struggle um, until you have built that badass team. Ideally, that's how you really maximize um, these lessons. And so when you get to lesson seven, the idea of creating the struggle is where now what you're doing is you're proactively, thoughtfully, um, planning how you can stretch and grow. You know, I, I refer to on my website is, you know, be like Gumby and stretch them, right? So how do I, how do I stretch them outside their comfort zones? How do I leverage them beyond their current position? How do I develop them? Um, how do I um, help cross pollinate the team so that we have a multitude of strengths on the team and we build that bench strength so that we have the capacity to buy another ranch or to move into another business venture and have people that we've harvested or developed within the organization and um, within the operation that we can leverage and move and, and grow and expand. And so creating the struggle is just giving them an opportunity to develop their skill sets and get outside their comfort zones. This came to mind, and I'm, I'm sure it's not new. You know, you always hear that there's no I in team, and then the guy responds, you know, the smart aleck responds, yeah, but there is a me. Well, I'm like, yeah, but if we make this team about me, we're all going to go through the meat grinder. You can also anagram team to meet. So. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, and, and, and that's true. It's me to we. We want to go from me to we. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, the create the struggle um, – is is kind of about giving people more responsibility, um, more freedom to kind of make decisions on their own, and and some of those things. Is that is that true? Yeah, and it's getting them involved in you know uh, you know solving solving problems. Well, let's just use a um, and it, well, I'll use this in, in the next lesson. But uh, you know, getting them outside their comfort zone. I have plenty of team members who said, you know, well, I'm not, not comfortable. I'm just used an example, um, speaking in front of a group. Well, great. So then let's set up a time and and let's get you outside your comfort zone. What does support look like for you? You know, how can I help prepare you so that you can go to the livestock association and you can share your story. Right. And, um, and, and get them comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable and growing and expanding. So building those competencies outside of their comfort zone, you know, as I said earlier, growth and possibility does not live inside our comfort zone. It lives outside. And so our job as leaders is to recognize the potential potentially untapped talent or capabilities within our teams and then figure out how to tap into that and leverage it. There's no better pay grade than to invest in the intellectual capital and development of your people. People will stay with you for less money 
if they, one, feel cared about, two, know that they trust who they work for, three, you're prioritizing them, right? And then now you're developing and investing them in their intellectual development and their capabilities and building their competence and confidence. Now there's a loyalty and you've built a community and a family through a bad team. So now those relationships and that bond, that, that stickiness when it comes to people um, staying with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Sticky teams, you know, be, yeah. building teams that that uh, stick together uh, because it's a it's a a lot of a lot of work <laughs> to yeah. start over. You know, to well, start, and, start and with they new people, attract people too to that stickiness. Right? right, you have someone that loves where they work and things are going well, and you know the families are talking about how you know you know Joe loves to you know, the ranch that he's working on. And then other people are like, Hey, if you ever have an opening over there, let me know. So then you have people really lining up for you so that in the event that somebody has a turn, there's a turnover or you make an additional venture investment in an, another avenue of your business, you've always got people who are vying to be on your team and your team will be very protective of who they bring in mm. to that badass team. They're, they're going to tell you, no, don't bring, you know, Tom over here because he's going to create problems. He created, and we don't want to mess up what we've got here. So then they'll be very protective and, um, and help you choose the right players. Those people that are coming in are people who've already brought in, bought into the culture. That's what has attracted them is the culture that you've created. You bet. Yeah. So the stickiness isn't just internal, it's external. It attracts people to you, people Mm. who want to play on your team and want to represent your brand. Yep. And that's, Kind of leads into lesson number eight, uh, where Tom is creating drama. We don't want to bring him in here because he's he's kind of a drama follows Tom for some reason. Yes, yes, <laughs> and absolutely. And so lesson eight is really suck it up, buttercup. And I, you know, the example I'd like to share is because we're going through COVID-19, right? So now we're all in this state of, you know, in some capacity, we're either in fortunate enough to be in the business to where demand is through the roof, right? Because we are a mission critical um, service provider and our businesses are booming and growing and we are just drinking from the fire hose, trying to keep our heads above water to manage the scale of our business. And so we have to suck that up and figure out how, you know, how can we effectively lead our teams and lead our organizations through this um, struggle in a way that is good for our teams, good for our business. Well, the, the opposite uh, or the same is true, but, but different for those who are being negatively impacted. They haven't worked since COVID-19. They're, there's not enough government support and they're really struggling and they, you know, they're wondering if they're going to keep their homes or, or their apartments and or vehicles, you know. So um, as leaders, it's critically important that we, um, that we can, we suck it up, you know, that we you know, we have our experience. I'm not dismissing the fact that you have to experience your experience, but you don't want to have to spill over onto your team. Experience it privately among your friends, your family. Um, you can communicate it upward through your organization, through your superiors, but you don't want a downward vent to your teams. Um, it just fuels their fire and, and creates panic and it makes it really difficult. It has them take their eye off the ball and they lose focus. So it's really important that when we are in a struggle situation, that we model the behaviors of being able to cope, that we are supportive, that we are empathetic, and that more importantly, the best thing that we can do as leaders is to invite them to the party of solving the challenge, you know, crushing um, the obstacle to collectively as a team, have them be a part of formulating the very plan that's going to have everybody win or make it through the other side. And so that will help to ignite and inspire collective collaboration around problem solving and contributing to something that's more purposeful and meaningful that gives them a sense of value and stability. And that is critically important for us to do as leaders in times of struggle. And um, and if we're not keeping it together, then our teams are not going to be capable of keeping it together. Hmm. So are you talking about on some level uh, compartmentalization where your personal life is is handled with uh, people outside of your business so that it doesn't create issues within your business? Well, I do think that, you know, managing people is personal, but I do think that when it comes to, um, 
you know, we all need people. And, and when we get to lesson 11, when I say expand your tribe, you know, we need to have resources and mentors and people that we can lean on in the times that we don't want to have whatever's troubling us um, to spill over onto our teams. And so I do, um, I have learned to, I have now what I'm, what I'm suggesting in my book is only because I've screwed it all up. <laughs> so let me be clear. Um, I've made all of these mistakes and all of these bumps and bruises and boot and mouth, mouth moments. That's what the book is about. It's, it's, I share stories of where I did it. It's like, don't do this. Um, I have those stories throughout all the lessons in the book. So, um, so yes, it, it is really about um, understanding that you don't want to come in and verbally vomit all of your anxieties onto your team. It, it's, it can be catastrophic. And, and then it's really hard to keep yourself together and certainly going to be really difficult to keep your team together. And it can have them start to lose faith and faith and trust that you can actually handle it. So now we're backing, backtracking it back to less than three, right? Where now I've got to reestablish trust hmm. and show that I have the capacity to lead my team through this. Right. So there, there are some really important reasons why we have to leverage some other resources for us and make sure we have those resources available to us to help us navigate through. Yeah. So then we're capable of navigating our teams through. And, and what about managing drama within the team? You know, I, I uh, am a, a pastor <laughs> by trade. I <laughs> place a high value on, on scripture and, and what it has to speak into our lives. And so when I think about drama on a team, I think about Matthew chapter 18, uh, talks about how we handle conflict, uh, that we go directly to the person that we have an issue with, and we, we try to work it out there, and uh, we make sure that we aren't um, gossiping about that person or anything before we go deal with that person uh, individually. And then if, if that is if we can't work that out, maybe we invite somebody else in and say, "Am I understanding this right? Am I being a jerk here, or or is there really an issue here?" And then if there is, then we might go together to that person and try to try to come to an understanding before we take it to the whole team. So, how how do we handle how do we handle drama within the team? Uh, is that part of this lesson, or or does that lesson come later? Um, that is part of lesson um, six, and it also is mentioned in lesson eight. Lesson six is build the bad team, right? So, and also being an epic coach. So, it's establishing what I call that musketeer mentality of mm. how we're going to be for one another. And so, it's also inviting and encouraging. I'm a huge fan of conflict, and I think conflict is essential for business because if there isn't, I'm more concerned about the organizations that don't have conflict. Conflict, and and, and I want to make sure that I. Um, frame it up appropriately, conflict meaning productive conflict, right. because that means there's a sharing of ideas and we can disagree. And it's just teaching, it's our job as leaders is to teach people how to have conflict and have it not be, um, you know, disrespectful or aggressive and, you know, dog eat dog win lose. It's, it's more about contribution. So setting those ground rules for your team, which you would establish back through as you're coaching them and establishing trust and building that culture and that bad team, uh, this is how we engage. And when there is that drama, then what I like to do is um, have them work through it together with me and I'll coach um, and help them because everybody has their own based on their own personality. We mentioned disc earlier and has their own filters on how they perceive things to be. And it doesn't mean that one's right. And one's wrong. We just are filtering it differently. And so how can I help them come together and then hear one another and then work through um, the solutions together to solve both problems. It's not an either or it's an and. And so it's, again, it's about establishing and helping leaders with the skill sets they need to help people navigate through conflict, misunderstandings, disagreements in a way that's productive for their relationship. Um, unfortunately, in the past, what I was trained to do and what I used to do is, you know, you pull one person aside, you talk to them, and then you pull the other person aside, you talk to them, and then you go back to the to the first person and you follow up with them and there's just bouncing back and it's not very, uh, it's not a good economy of time and or people. And at the end of the day, the manager ends up interacting with the employees, but the employee relationship doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It doesn't improve. So the idea is to ultimately, again, create that musketeer 
um, mindset and have them solve it together and let them know that conflict is good. This is a, it's actually really good for business. It's just, we have to learn how to have conflict in a way that it's not destructive. It's productive. I think what, what you're talking about here is the idea of when we have conflict, when we initiate conflict, we are scrutinizing the ideas, not the people. We're scrutinizing the idea that they brought as a suggestion for a new practice or a new venture, and we're not scrutinizing the individual necessarily. I mean, there's a place for that. There's a place for individual performance reviews, and, and those things should be happening regularly as well. But where, when the whole team is together, we're scrutinizing ideas, not individuals. Yeah. And, and, it, and again, it goes back to, you know, who do we get to be to be a bad team and how are we going to treat one another? And then, and you have to remind them and remind them and remind them and remind them and hold their hands to the fire when they step out of line on, on what the commitments are of the team. And they, they will enjoy it. They'll perform better. They'll they'll trust one another because all of these things that we're establishing lessons one through twelve, um, you're also establishing and teaching the team. So they're doing that for one another, right? They're tr- learning to trust one another. They're prioritizing one another first, right? They're learning how to coach and give feedback productively, right? They're they're building their badass team together. You're helping to hold the space for them to do that as well as being able to give them the appropriate um, and timely feedback and encouragement along the way. Moving moving on, uh, not that we have tapped any or all of these by any means, but moving on to the next lesson just to just to complete the outline mm-hmm. for the day. <laughs> How are we <laughs> what are we what are we talking about in lesson number nine? Oh, don't be a kiss. <laughs> so that one that one is whether it be a kiss Within the organization, outside, within the community, within our, um, you know, affiliations, professional affiliations or political re- relationships, I think it's really important that we learn how to respectfully um, share our ideas and be authentic and not uh, tell them what they want to hear, but tell them what they need to hear, but tell them the right way, right? And so that quite simply is the, the message in lesson nine. And sure. don't make your people be a kiss. Right. That's a that's really important that you want to know what their thoughts are and you know what their ideas are what their concerns are if you don't know then you're back to lesson 1 of being an ass right it's about your ego Yeah what get what gets rewarded gets repeated right so you don't want yes. you don't want to lift up those people who are <laughs> are implementing those strategies <laughs> Yes absolutely And how does that relate to lesson 10 Well lesson 10 is really about being a groupie So, um, and that is, you know, sing the praises, find the Mm. the morsels of praise progress and, um, you know, be a a groupie for your people. They, they need to know that you're a fan and, you know, that's, I really sucked at this, um, earlier in my career. I did. I just was very good at finding that one little thing that wasn't right. And I had it wired wrong in my brain. I thought, well, if I, you know, give them progress, then they're going to take their foot off the gas. Or if I praise this, then they're not going to work as hard. They're going to think they can take advantage of me. So it's all of this very unhealthy, um, controlling ideas that I had and beliefs that I had that weren't serving me. And quite the opposite, you know, now every now and then, yep, we're going to have a bad apple, which we get to handle. But, uh, but when you can praise progress and celebrate the success of your people and talk about accomplishments and contributions, um, it's an absolute accelerator to outcomes, hands down. And yeah, I, I like it. It's, this is all interesting, as you said, how it fits together, how it builds on itself, um, how one lesson leads to the next. Um, it's, it's well thought out. Uh, I want to make sure I say Thank that. On the, uh, <laughs> not on the front <laughs> end, but it, towards the end, you, you've, it's, it's good. I really appreciate it. So uh, lesson 11, uh, what are we talking about here? Expand your tribe. You know, we need people. They need, they need us. It's really important important that we um, leverage relationships through the within the organization external to the organization within the within the agricultural community Mm. you know I was very um, uh, an extremely pathetically late bloomer when it came to this and again I was holding things close to the vest I was busy competing playing win-lose with my competitors and I missed out on tremendous opportunities there's so much um, that we can learn from one another and we are always better together 
And we need to leverage the heck out of that as soon as possible. Um, and uh, so that's what the, the, um, my passion is about uh, lesson 11 and don't wait <laughs> it, do it now. Yeah, I think that's a good a good nugget there, a good note of finding finding those relationships outside the team that can be be mutually beneficial for for both teams. Uh that's that's good. Absolutely. Is that a is that a good understanding of what you're talking about there? I yes. Mean, it's, it's more yes. than that, but it, it definitely includes that, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. And finally, lesson 12, uh what are what are we talking about here? Lesson 12 is love somebody like you. So what that means is take care of yourself, right? We, if we are not taking care of ourselves, then we are not going to be very good at handling lessons one through 11, right? So um, love somebody like you is critically important. And that being said, I also share a personal story in the book about when um, that became an inspiration for me. But I had to be authentic and honest in the writing of the book and that, you know, a lot of people would say, well, shouldn't that be lesson one? I mean, shouldn't we do that first? And absolutely do it first. But it would have been dishonest for me to put it as lesson one if I'm not walking what I'm talking. (laughs) And the reality is this has been a struggle for me, prioritizing myself and taking care of me and um, not just being a workaholic. You know, I'm a high DI on DISC. And so I am very action results and um, and enthusiasm oriented. And also I have challenge in my profile. And so my drug is go, 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 do, do, do. And then it's like, oh yeah, right. I've got to also care for myself. And so I'm a work in progress in, in this arena, but it is critically important. And I would encourage every listener to do this first. <laughs> and it's, it's very, very important. But for me, it would have been dishonest to put, to put it where it doesn't live. <laughs> for me, it lives in lesson 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, so I kind of, as we, as we move toward wrapping up here, I guess one of the questions that came to my mind while we were talking is, is there a time for people to find a new team? I mean, how do we, how do we, cross that bridge? Uh, how do we know when it's time? Uh, how do we facilitate that process? Yes. So yeah, I call them kind of vote them off your island or have them find a new ship, or maybe they want to find a new ship for themselves. And, um, and that is, you know, if someone is, you know, where I've done all the right things, right? So let's just assume that I'm a bad leader and I'm putting these lessons into play and I'm giving platinum style feedback and I'm, you know, cultivating trust. And I just have, you know, a, uh, what I term in the book as a swashbuckler, right? Aboard the ship that needs to be tossed overboard. Then we need to handle that swiftly and we need to document it appropriately. We need to have those coaching conversations right away and set those expectations clear and then keep Mm -hmm. our eye on the ball. And if the behavior doesn't um, improve them, we need to vote them off our island, pull over and have them, you know, I say walk the plank. And that's uh, a critical skill set for us as leaders and something that we have to do. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to go all the way back to eroding trust and starting to unravel that bad team. And so that's something that leaders get to do swiftly after we've done everything we need to do with our selfie first, right? And making sure that we're being the best leader we can be. But sometimes we just get, you know, a bad pirate (laughs) aboard and we get to handle that. Other times on the flip side of that would be, let's say we have someone who is really ready for a change. And, um, you know, maybe we're at a point where we don't have the capacity, we're not expanding, that we can't, they're ready, but we can't move them into the next opportunity. Then the best thing that you can do is expand your tribe and reach out and serve your community and some of your, you know, be it competitors or to say, hey, I've got this great guy, you know, and, and start cross-pollinating within the community of sharing talent and um, from, because what you'll find is when you do it, other people will, will reciprocate. And then now we're building a network of talent that we can share throughout um, the, agri- this, the agricultural community. And there's nothing better than to be generous mm. and to give and to focus outward because then you're taking care. Mm. That's mm. the way I see it. And when I shifted my mindset to start doing that, I found that I always, I could call 
my what would what be deemed competition and say, hey, you know, I have this person mm-hmm. and they say, oh, well, I'll call you when I, I have someone and people would say, oh, they'll never call. They call and they do yeah. refer back. So uh, that's what I would encourage people to do. Hmm, I like it. That's real good. So I guess the last question I've got for you is, is there a happy ending uh, for the for the Chicago uh, cataclysmic wake up call, <laughs> or or was it was it a, a tough lesson to learn? <laughs> it was it was a journey. So it was a thirty four year journey. But the mm. uh, the way that that initial cataclysmic ended was they walked out and they they were gone, and that was unfortunate and and truly is the um, the sole inspiration for why I think I went on to become very, very passionate about figuring the people thing out. I Mm. feel like I owe it to them. And I, and I, and I have a tremendous amount of gratitude. Uh, I'm so thankful that I got the lesson and so um, apologetic and remorseful over having caused that type of pain. I mean, when you think about when we suck as leaders, for lack of a better expression, Mm -hmm. um, we don't just affect the, the individual, we affect how they interact on their way home, be it in traffic, when they stop at the store, um, mm-hmm. how they treat, you know, the public, when they go home, how they treat their family, their animals and, and their pets and interact in their communities. And so that, that toxicity or that poor leadership um, that we have, uh, it, it has um, an emotional wake that, that carries beyond the workplace. And so we get to be responsible for that as leaders. And so I felt that I needed to do a reparation, if you will, and this book and brand gives me that opportunity. But with that team, there wasn't a happy ending, but I did bring in the next team. And, um, and then each year thereafter, I get a little better than I was the year before. But I continued, as you'll know, in reading through the book, um, there were lots of bumps and bruises. The majority of the book are boot and mouth moments, bumps and bruises, lessons learned. And that's how the 12 lessons were um, comprised was based on, you know, the greatest teacher we have is hopefully um, taking time out to learn from our failures and, and try and find those grand granules of lessons learned and then make sure that we're not letting history repeat itself and then share our lessons and our bumps and bruises to try and help others prevent themselves from what I call the bull ride. So you mentioned that every year you got a little bit better. Uh, is there a goal setting process that you followed that facilitated that? I would say that that I'm a, because I'm a D on disc. Um, I'm very oriented to goals. I mean, I set goals on my to do lists and priorities every single day. So that's something that really fuels me. But yes, I I set goals for um, personal development. And I invested the greatest investment we can make is in ourselves as leaders to make sure that we are tapping into resources and tools and and that we're self-developing, that we're not just going through the motions of tasks, that we understand that the people come first and then that's they are they're executing the processes and the tasks. And so we need to prioritize the people part. And so self-development was, has always been on my radar. And even as an entrepreneur, I started my leadership development company in 2000, January, 2012. And I, I'm constantly learning something new and investing, continuing to invest in myself. And that's, will be forever. I mean, that's really an important, that's the most important thing I can do is invest in my own intellectual capital. Michelle, it's been very good today. So much good stuff. I mean, our people are our results. That's a, yes. that's a dynamite. <laughs> so, yes, they uh, are. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we get to measure their results. Uh, but when we're managing people, uh, they are our results and how well they how well they flourish. So I really appreciate that as, as well as a host of, of other things. Uh, so if people want to learn from your mistakes, uh, how would they go about getting the book? I would love to invite your listeners um, to uh, visit, first and foremost, badassleader.com, and then have them put in forward slash podcast dash gift, and they'll be able to download some free goodies for listening Mm. today. And then, of course, now that's a special gift page that's been created. So it's badassleader.com forward slash podcast dash gift. But then the website is badassleader.com. And there they can check out the book, learn more about each of the lessons. There, I would definitely encourage them to have fun going through the toolbox page. Hmm. 
and reading through and clicking through that, they can get some great ideas on how to really accelerate those lessons and and uh, add that VP racing fuel for people I was talking about. And so that would be fantastic. And then my invitation for the listeners would be to add, I love your um, comment that you make in all of your podcasts, which is, you know, you know, good morning, critter and land loving folks. So I would invite them to add people, critter and land loving folks to that um, messaging, because at the end of the day, you know, our people come first and our people are our results and our mirror. So um, thank you so much, Clay, for the opportunity to share and to certainly serve those who have served my family, our our country, Mm -hmm. and communities. And it is humbling to um, work for those who feed. Hmm. And then do you do do, uh, on-ranch consulting or um, um, seminars? Uh, Yes. Could organizations bring you in? Can individual ranches bring you in? Uh, Some of those things? Yes, absolutely. I do on ranch. I um, have held leadership development programs ever since 2013. Um, my parent company, which is my other brand, the corporate brand, is MDR Coaching and Consulting. And the um, but go to Bad Leader and it'll get you there. But yes, absolutely. On ranch consulting organizations can bring me in. I also do distance coaching. I bad leader coaching. So a lot of the ranches I work with currently, I'll usually fly in, do an on-ranch, and then we'll stay connected through bad leader coaching, be it monthly. Most of them do every other week, but whatever you need, we'll customize it um, to make it work for you and your goals and objectives. Well, yeah, I really appreciate your time today. Links to all that will be in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 158. So if you want to check out the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 158, there will be a link to that podcast gift uh, that Michelle has set up for you, and we will we'll send people your direction. So M- Michelle, thanks for your time today. Oh, always a pleasure. Thanks so much, Clay. You take care. Well, uh, really helpful stuff. You know, I guess can't can't talk about people too much. It's it's definitely a neglected topic. Definitely something that we've got to continue to remember. Uh, without good people management skills, we are really setting up a house of cards uh, in our businesses. So uh, now next week we're gonna we're gonna talk about soil from the ground up. We're gonna talk about what what are our, what are the weeds in our field in our pastures telling us how do we manage them? How do we uh, be patient in the management of the weeds? And and nobody in that I know of, um, if there's somebody else, go ahead and contact me, uh, workingcows.net slash contact. Uh, You can send me an email there through the website and let me know. But there's nobody I know of better to talk about that subject than uh, Nicole Masters. And so really excited for episode 159 of the Working Cows podcast coming your way very soon with Nicole Masters. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, Tune in next week.